I am here to tell you about movement. I trained as a neuroscientist, but I got really obsessed with behavior and particularly eye movement. And I'm going to particularly tell you about a set of studies that I conducted here um, that was particularly designed to address one aspect of attention in children with autism. But it actually redirected my studies into the importance of play. And so Roger very kindly uh, brought me back to some of the work that I did with Terry Sanofsky as a postdoc. And during that time, I was really taken by how people learn super early, and by people I mean young children learn where to look in our environment. And this picture illustrates it super clearly. So this is a, an example where the, somebody's just looking around this image to see what's going on. But if I were to ask people to look at um, the picture and estimate the ages of people here, they would look at the face, the face, the face, the face. The face, and this is hap this happens even with young children because we know where to find information in our environment. We learn it very quickly and implicitly, and this is something that can differ in children with autism. It's one of the many things that can differ, and it's one of the things that develops very early on through play-based relationships. So, in the in the the twenty years that uh, Roger was discussing, I got very interested in using games and game-based technologies in order to study behavior, in order to make assessments and make some interventions. And of course, this picture here shows us what many of us think of as play, physically moving, running, sliding, swinging in our environment. But this is also play, right? Um, and a lot of the same things that make play exciting in this environment also make it exciting in this environment. And those things include autonomy, right? You get to pick generally what you want to do when you're playing. You have a sense of purpose. I want to go down that slide. I want to capture the treasure in the video game. Um, there's a sense of mastery. You can engage things again and again and again. You can try and try to succeed on your quest. There is a, a usually a relatively safe and explorable amount of uncertainty in games. Some games, and particularly I think all of us know so many people for whom games can be very immersive, you know, super, super focused. Um, there's a sense of competition at times, but also social interaction, peer reinforcement. These things I've seen time and time again in working with, and I typically work with teens on the autism spectrum, teens and young adults, most of whom, uh, thank you very much, Allison, for giving us that wonderful talk this morning about the, this broad spectrum. Most of the people I work with have relatively minimal support needs, um, and I'll explain in part why that is, but we're moving to other parts of the spectrum as well. Um, but, th but the idea is that there's this, these are powerful ways to play and to learn in the autism community as well as in the broader community. And so why don't we use them in order to make better assessments, put people in the best place we possibly can to measure something, and help people want to engage with their therapies? So I told you that I'd tell you a little story about um, some interventions that we built back in, we're starting around 2012, around the time when this paper came out from Sean Green and Daphne Balvier that was talking about serious games because it was found that individuals who played a genre of games called action video games, the ones that you tend to think of as the shoot 'em up the really fast movement, so games that demanded integration over a broad area, fast shifts of attention. People who played those games tended to have improvements over those who didn't in perception, visual spatial attention, um, movement skill, and also working memory. So there's a, a bunch of issues with this literature, and this was very early days, but you know, there are some self-selections in this population. Of course, if you already have better skills in those domains, you'll find games more appealing. But it was also found in some studies that for people who didn't play and weren't necessarily good at those things, playing these types of games actually did build skills. Interesting. We wanted to use them for a very specific purpose. We wanted to make video games to improve specific attention skills in young, so teens, uh, most, it was mostly teens through young adults with autism. And the specific 
specific type of attention, because attention is a very broad construct, is a type of orienting attention. I'm going to tell you a little bit about the data that led us to that. Um, and But importantly, we really wanted to do this in a way that was different from some um, prior intervention studies because we knew from the literature that you know, doing this in a way that required people to come to our lab multiple times per week, like you have to go to the gym in order to exercise, wasn't necessarily going to work. We needed to make it accessible in their home so they can do it three to five times a week, right? I get on my rowing machine much more because it's in my basement than I would if I had to get in my car and drive um, because that just doesn't happen as often, right? Same thing here. We wanted to make it very accessible. We wanted to make it home-based on a computer that anyone could use. Um, we specifically, and I'll talk a little bit more about this, we make these games that are not using a mouse, not using a touchscreen, but using their eyes because we believe that gaze opens a back door to the neural circuitry underlying attention. Okay, so why did we do this? And that's my colleague, Jean Townsend. She had shown um, back um, in 1995 and 99 some studies using I'm just going to call it a Posner-like queuing task. So it's a task where there's a queue and then later a target that appears either in the same location of the queue or on the other side, a very you know, nerdy, controlled type of experiment that we do in, in our lab. But the special thing was that the time between the queue and the target could be varied. It could be very short, 100 milliseconds, or it could be long, 800 milliseconds. And in the span, if we're talking about eye movement behavior, 800 milliseconds is kind of an eternity because we make approximately three to four saccadic eye movements. Those are the very fast eye movements you use to explore your world, use to read a book. These are the ones we make all the time. Three to four every second. Okay, so you can make a lot of them in 800 milliseconds. It's a long time in terms of neural processing, in terms of this type of behavior. So what we're seeing is that um, typical kids of the same age as our autism population, regardless of whether the queue appeared 100 milliseconds or 800 milliseconds before the target, they did equivalently well, hovering up here a little above 90%. The ASD group, when given 800 milliseconds to process the queue, did pretty well, comparably, honestly, with, that, with the other group. But 100 milliseconds was not enough time to orient their attention. And this is not a movement. We had them fixating in the center. This is to, to send their covert or orient, orienting, their mind's eye, if you will, to the spot where the target was about to appear so that they can discriminate it and give the right answer. It was too fast. And this is something that we thought was perhaps very core, perhaps the sort of thing that actually could, if, if detected early, could build into um, something that is a skill that helps people pick up subtle social signals. I am fond of saying that if you're not fast with your eye movements in a dynamic social setting, you'll miss that cue that tells you that mom is a little annoyed with you, right? If you didn't see my eyebrow raise, then you missed a very important cue. And there are lots of these subtle social cues that are part of our everyday dynamics and our kids on the autism spectrum may very well be missing them. How can we try to ameliorate this? And this is where we get to why in the world would you want to play video games with your eyes versus with all the other ways we have to play video games. And it's because the saccadic eye movement circuit, again, saccades being those really fast eye movements that we make three to four times a second is widely distributed throughout the brain. It is very, they, they involve a lot of processing, a lot of visual processing, a lot of auditory processing. We don't just make eye movements to things we see, but to things we hear. So you can very well say that the voluntary saccad circuit is equivalent to the voluntary attention circuit, how we shift our gaze, right? And I showed you data about attention previously, but it could just as well be about saccadic eye movements, right? If I'm showing you in a very simple task, I present a single big old target on a screen, and I ask someone to align their gaze with it, make, make a saccade to it. The kids on the autism spectrum in red, it takes them more eye movements to align 
Every one of those takes longer, meaning you're missing information. The very first one they launch takes longer, and the first one they launch is less accurate, which is, of course, related to the fact that it takes longer overall to orient. So how can we use what we know about this circuitry in order to ameliorate these kinds of effects? So together with Jean, we designed, so she, she's been studying attention, she's a neuropsychologist, has been in this for a much longer time, and I came from a very different background studying eye movements. Together we decided to make a suite of games that you play with your eyes, to use this circuitry kind of as a harness to try to train attention. And we made a suite of games with a lot of different kinds of um, training principles in them, and I'm gonna show you them. So uh, here we're hitting um, the moles that are popping out of the ground, except for that special mole. Okay, so these guys, that have the, they're the bandit moles. We hit them to pop them back into the ground, but the mole that has the, the glasses on, we call it the professor mole, and we don't hit professors here at UCSD or at Northeastern. So, and the kids get it, they get it really quickly. So this is a, a task that requires them to switch fast between go to it, Take a break from it. This is training a different kind of principle. This is tr training steady fixation, which is needed because if you don't have steady fixation, then you're accumulating time before you can make the next, next movement. This is a really fast game that requires you to get through that green gate. It doesn't start out this fast. And make a decision about whether or not you could pick up that star along the way. That's an executive decision that you have to make super fast given the, the temporal demand of your eye movement in order to guide your eye. So this is actually, at the time, was my eight-year-old playing that game, and he loved th that game. This is a game that actually one of our um, then high school interns made, which is a beautiful game, but it's much harder. Your job is to actually avoid the heads of all the little comets coming at you, and you have to stay in this aperture. It's extremely hard because we don't typically look into empty space. It is a very much a game about avoiding looking at things and looking into empty space. And so that comes, we unlock that game in training after you've done a bunch of other things. These are just a sample of some of the games that we have. Um, I just wanted to show you some effects because we saw some, and this was a small clinical trial, but it, was, it, it generated a lot of excitement. And we of course saw improvements in the game. Of course you did, right? The kids played the games a lot. You saw improvements in the game. But these were things that we observed outside gameplay. So this was in um, being able to look more, more um, steadily at targets in terms of fixation, deviation, um, improvements in post versus pre. Um, that the accuracy of something called an anti-saccade, so instead of making a movement to a target, you actually suppress that movement and make it in the opposite direction. That requires an incredible amount of inhibitory control. And during our training, the kids got much better, so their accuracy improved uh, after training. So we also engaged kids in simulating driving tasks. And here I learned that nine-year-olds shouldn't be put in a driving simulator because they like to crash. Um, that, that, was a, that was a good learning. Um, but, uh, but generally, we're trying to get to, to something that was more a real-world transfer, so a little bit less like the kind of task we typically use in the lab. And so we did see some benefits in divided attention in this task, but not necessarily in um, in um, road excursions, partly because they were all really bad drivers, uh, so, particularly the young ones. Um, but this, these were some nice effects. We also saw some effects in the kids who, um, so all of these kids had uh, a, a ADOS, a community diagnosis, which was verified with the ADOS too. So that meant that they were, um, you know, primarily diagnosed with autism, but several of them also had ADHD. The kids who had um, ADHD, when we actually learned later to just give this tool to all of our kids, um, they actually showed on the, the screener tool that we gave to the parents a lower rate of endorsing ADHD symptoms after training. So although these were made specifically to target that orienting aspect of tension, the kind of attention that kids with ADHD have a, a tend to have a problem with, which is more of a focus, um, is also seems to be improved. 
Along the way, we generated a bunch of assessments because we realized that in order to assess things out in the field, we would need to actually um, translate those from the kinds of tasks that we used in the lab. And so I can show you these really quickly. This is basically like a ghost buster, you know, pull the ghost in. That is a basic saccade center out task, kind of like I showed you the data for, but it, this is more fun. I think this is a really excellent task, and this one has legs. This one is basically a continuous performance task for those of you who know what that means. Your job is to just look at the fire, keep the soup going, and ignore everything else that's going on in the campground, which is hard because there's eyes popping up, there will be some animals popping up. <laughs> and so this is a very sensitive test. And it, and it compares nicely with standardized tests of continuous performance that tend to make kids cry. Uh, no joke, like they tend to make kids cry. <laughs> so nobody wants to do a continuous performance test. That's very palatable. Um, this is a test that's very much like the one where we, I showed you with Jean's um, picture on it, right? This is a kind of attention orienting, covert attention orienting task where the cue and target, so the cue is the brightening of the box, and the target, believe it or not, one of those paws pops up first before the other two. And you have to detect that, and the kids do. This is an anti-saccade assessment. So um, basically, your job is to find the fish and ignore the turtle, um, but the fish isn't always there. The turtle pops up first, and when he does, you have to look in the opposite side. Don't look at the turtle. Ah, bummer, missed it. So again, don't look at the turtle there. So that was that was the fish came up first, and when the last one will actually get it right, it takes a bit, but but he gets it right. So his first movement wasn't correct, and we can collect all of these movements and try to analyze what is going on with their behavior. I told you that this correlates really nicely with. Um, uh, a, a test that's out there, the TOAV, um, and this is some, some nice behavior. We need to do a little more work on this. However, my colleague Joe Snyder and I did publish on some early results. You'll see that there is, I, I'm um, the, the acting chief science officer of BrainLeap Technologies because these games were very exciting um, to some of the people in our community, and UCSD helped us start a company so that we can make them more available. The pandemic made that kind of hard, but we do actually have some things that um, individuals can use, but we're mostly interested in getting them into schools where they could be accessible to, to all. We did a school in-school study with the University of Florida and we saw some nice effects. Um, these, this is just very generic. Improvements in fast gaze shifts, improvements in inhibitory control and fast attention shifts, but in those those tests that I was just showing you, we see nice improvements over time, right? And this is over many, many kids as opposed to the previous plot that I just whizzed by, it was only one kid. Okay, so I've been talking to you for a couple minutes here about the, these games, and I think that games are really, really powerful for assessment and potential interventions, and we're continuing down that line. On this path, while I was doing this work and we were I was a lot younger then. We were also a poor lab. So even though we got a clinical study, clinical trial, we were using a first-in-class eye tracker that could actually attach to a laptop computer that could actually go home, and it broke a lot. <laughs> this is what happens with first-in-class things. But I'm glad it did, because I got to meet a lot more people in our community because it broke. I got to go out to folks' homes and go give them another one, go figure out what's going on. And in that time, I got to see the reason why these kids were so excited about our study. Because they're writing game narratives in their home. Because they're drawing detailed storylines about the video game they have in their head. Because they're making their own games and it's all stuck at home. And so this was the first time that I was like, this is nuts, we can't, we can't let this happen because this is some amazing talent that's stuck in our homes and it's not getting to the light of day. So in 2018, I applied to the San Diego Foundation and they approved some funding for our first internship where we had um, 25 autistic young people come and work with us to make video games in teams. And it was beautiful. And we had a fantastic showcase event here at San Diego. Fortunately, the National Science Foundation liked the idea um, and the idea of using game-based tech for assessments in order to do some workforce preparation. And so we got another four years of funding. 
So we were doing that work here um, at the Power of Neuro Gaming Center, now also collaborating with my colleague Pam Cosman here. So we have spread because I'm now the Regame XR lab for rehabilitation game at Northeastern. And we were really interested, and this is a picture from that 2018 in-person program, and we were able to really put to test this idea that when we brought people together who were passionate about games, they really showed us what they could do. The motivation, just like I showed in that first slide, the power, what's, it, what's special about video games, they used it to build job skills, okay? And we went on to do this for several more years. You can learn a little bit more about this at diverseinternship.com. I'm really pleased to say that we made it through the pandemic where we had to have uh, two remote internship programs. That was tough, but we did it. Uh, we figured out how to have groups of people working together online supported by coaches. I think that's important, uh, coach support. Through these years, we've had people help us out. So we've had clients in the community host projects, video games. Uh, we had a video game from Sandag. How do you get from here to there in the most efficient way? And have you know, a group of five working on it. It was fantastic. And so we, we're now doing this in two sites. And I want to share with you, lest you think that this is incredibly Pollyanna-ish, I'm not the only one. I started this out thinking this is a great way to learn tech skills to get a job. I now am very happy to stand here saying this is a great way to, if you want tech skills to get a job, sure. If you want to be in the game industry, they actually very well may want you. Because the game industry has recognized, and you can look up something called the, the Yuki survey, uh, it's the UK um, based survey of the game industry, showing they actually track what proportion of people that are in their field that identify as neurodivergent. And it's about 18%. That's 18% who say yes, who are willing to raise their hand and, and that know it and then that identify, right? Interesting. So the gaming industry has recognized the need to attract talent from this pool. And we've partnered in particular with Ubisoft. And so I want to show you just a really quick clip from my colleague Pierre Esketch um, welcoming the interns at this year's in-person internship program. So this is a showcase event from the in-person program. We made it. Um, and and how, how he talks about this. To develop great games, we need to call for a wide range of talents. And we need all type of talents. And what we would like to share with you today is that neurodivergent talents are more than welcome to develop games. And at Ubisoft, we are quite a few developers to self-identify as neurodivergent. To illustrate that, about 18 months ago, we created an employee resource group on neurodiversity. And it is growing every day. And it already gathers 350 colleagues across 20 different countries. And all neurological conditions are represented in this group from the spectrum of autism to ADHD or learning disorders like uh, dyslexia. So we know about the talent and skills we can bring as neurodivergent to develop great games. And we can only encourage you to continue experimenting developing games. What we also learned is that to access and unlock fully our talents, we as an employer need to adapt our work environment to each and every one of our colleagues. And this is why we created this year an official neurodiversity talent program at Ubisoft, part of the HR team and the diversity and inclusion team. And together with the employer resource group, we aim to empower current and future neurodiverse employees and give them the support they need to realize their full potential. And you know, for the coming years, we are facing a major challenge, just like many other tech companies. It's to find and recruit more diverse game developers. And this could be you, and you could become our future colleagues. So I would like to thank very much Leanne and the Northeastern uh, uh, team uh, to drive this awesome internship project. Um, this is an alternative way for us to detect develop and promote atypical talents. And we need more of this in the future. 
So I wish you an excellent event. And to all the interns, keep on going. You're doing great. Thank you. Pierre Esketch is the head of neuro neurodiversity at Ubisoft. Let me say that again. At Ubisoft, this global AAA studio has a head of neurodiversity, and he and his team have been going around talking about how you should start employee research groups at your company. I also work with a wonderful person named Eris Bricker, who actually came out of the Game Science and Design Master's Program at Northeastern, who is now at Red Storm, an Ubisoft studio at, um, at uh, North, North Carolina. They are inspiring. They talk at global game jams. They've, they've talked at a recent neurodiversity event all about the things that you can do in your workplace to better support and attract neurodivergent talent. This is coming from the games industry, about which you've heard many terrible things, <laughs> but there's, <laughs> rightly so, but, there, but there's a, a, a change afoot and it's very exciting. So I wanna just end by saying that we don't just host internships and, and you know, make video games for for the purposes of um, training specific cognitive skills, but we're using video game tech. This is a VR system that one of my graduate students, Trent Simmons, has been working on in order for us to study social interactions in a controlled manner. So the point is that two people are actually in this space. They're across from each other, and what they're doing is they're looking at this built this puzzle over here and they're trying to recreate it here by grabbing blocks that fall down. And so we can actually have a very, very sort of locked down sequence of movements that we can compare across uh, subjects and in conditions where one person is playing and when two people are playing. And the kind of thing we're observing, which is exciting to us, is that even in this environment where you don't really see a person fully embodied, you take away a lot of the social signals, the face. I mean, this is just a ping pong ball that they see effectively, right? That our autistic participants are slower in the social condition, in any of the movements that require fast temporal integration. In some of the other movements, not no difference at all. It seems to have to do with that fast integration and movement that presents a challenge, and it's more evident in this social environment. When again, these um, puzzled pieces are dropping. And so in particular, that the fast piece is when the, when the blocks are dropping versus when they're already still and you're moving them. So it's the same kind of movement, the same orienting behavior, except in one case, something is falling and you need to integrate that over time. That's the condition in which having another person across from you, even virtually, takes more time in people with autism. So um, I wanna thank some folks who, some of whom moved with me, Ara here on the right, Trent and Sundar were here in San Diego and Minchin joined us when we moved. Um, but we, uh, this was very early days, this was October, 2021. We were at an event that Northeastern holds in order to attract undergraduates to the lab. And we've been very successful. We've been doing a bunch of different things. And I highlight this picture in particular because we now have a first year PhD student named Uri Seitz, who is interested in using games and game-based technology in order to change the way we offer inputs for AAC devices. So we are, mostly working with individuals who have um, minimal support needs, but we're moving in that direction because it absolutely needs to be done. And so I'm thrilled that Uri wants to do that and we have the support and colleagues to do that. He comes from an, a computer background. The human computer interaction community is very behind this. So I'm super excited about the things he's trying. And I do wanna uh, end though with a small note of caution that in using games and engaging games can have its effects because this is our lab right now and dinners have gotten very expensive. <laughs> so <laughs> it's wonderful that so many people are excited about what we're doing, but it's a little nuts and management has become a deep and dire need. So, so we have a bunch of really exciting projects and I hope that um, the next time I come visit you, it will be warmer, uh, but I will have, be able to tell you more about the great work that these fantastic young people are engaging for our community. Thank you very much. Thank you.